will be on diversifiable and non-diversifiable risk. So in broad terms, why is some risk diversifiable? Why are some risks non-diversifiable? Does it follow that an investor can control the level of unsystematic risk in a portfolio, but not the level of a systematic risk? So first of all, let's talk what is diversifiable and what is non-diversifiable risk. Okay, so these are the two risks here, diversifiable and non-diversifiable. The terms itself from diversifiable means it could be diverse of. Okay, so risks under this category are usually company or firm specific risks. That means the risk is basically specifically on one particular firm or a sector or industry. Okay, so it's called a company or a firm specific risk. Whereas a non diversifiable risk is usually the market risk. So, market risk very hard to prevent, but company and firm specific risk could be prevented by having a portfolio of stocks. By having a portfolio of stocks, that means different industry, different company, they balance off your portfolio and reduce your risk. So when there is reduced or being prevented, that is diversifiable. Whereas non-diversifiable are things like market risk. Okay, risk that affect every single person. Everybody affected. All right. So when a risk that affect every single person, that's a market risk. Or that is a non-diversifiable risk. But when the risk is only specifically applied to a particular company or applied to a particular sector, that is a diversifiable risk. Okay, so the other terms for these two risks, they could be called as unsystematic and systematic risk. Alright, for this non-diversifiable, it's called a systematic risk. This is also known as the unsystematic risk. So this is the basic introduction or basic uh, uh, understanding about diversifiable and non-diversifiable risks. Okay, so have a good idea about this and uh, you need further definition of it, you can always refer to the textbook. So let's go to 11.3 together. So 11.3, they give you a number of scenario here for you to identify whether it's a systematic or unsystematic risk here. Okay, so we go through case by case basis. So if you look at 11.3 here, classifying the following event as mostly systematic or mostly unsystematic is the definition clear in every cases. So let's go through one by one of those cases. So case A, short-term interest rate increase unexpectedly. So when there's an increase of uh, interest rate in short terms uh, borrowing unexpectedly, this is affecting every single body. Uh, every single company is affected. It's not specifically on a particular company only. So everyone is generally being affected here. This is an announcement being made. So in this case here, this is a systematic risk. Okay, because everyone is affected by short-term interest rate increases. Then B, the interest rate a company pays on its short-term debt borrowing is increased by its bank. Pay close attention. Eh? The interest rate a company pays on its short term borrowing is increased by its bank. So that means one particular company's short term borrowing has an increase in their interest rate by their own bank. So this is affecting only one company. So this case it's considered as unsystem. Yes, correct. Yasin. As unsystematic. Okay, very good. Then C. This is a special case here. <laughs> Oil price unexpectedly declined. Okay, this incident is both systematic and unsystematic risk. Why would I say so? Because when you say oil price unexpectedly decline, it will first affect oil firm first. Okay, you will affect the sector, the industry, the oil industry. So those companies are actually badly affected due to the decline. But due to domino effect, every single other businesses, it's generally affected by oil prices too. So it could be a 
both systematic and unsystematic risk. Okay, it could be started as unsystematic risk and the domino effect would cause a systematic risk. Okay, so this is a special part, which is both, okay, both of the risk based on your explanation. D, uh, this is the question where a lot of students were confused uh, comparing to the issue in C. An oil tanker ruptures, creating a large oil spill. Is this a systematic or unsystematic risk? Is it affecting one company or every single company or every single one? Anybody? Hmm. The yeah. case unsystematic. Okay, yes, D is unsystematic. All right, because they are telling you an oil tanker. So whoever owned this oil tanker are the only one affected or is the only one affected. Okay, so if the oil tank uh, belongs to Shell, then Shell is the one affected. It will not affect Petronas. It will not affect uh, British Petroleum. It will not affect Exxon Mobil. So only Shell will be affected. So this is specific to a particular firm. So this is unsystematic. Okay, coming to E, a manufacturer, when you realize the words a manufacturer losses a multi-million dollar, you know this is specific to that company, so it's also unsystematic. And the last one, a Supreme Court decision substantially broadens producer liability for injuries by product user. So this is a new rules being implemented for all production line. Okay, wherever if there's a product user being suffered from injuries, there is an increase in liability. So this implementation is to every single company. So this is also a systematic risk. It's to everybody. Okay. Good, Yasin, that you understood what is going on here. All right. So moving on to the final and last theory questions for today. This question might be a bit the just to explain to you in most straightforward way so that you can understand what does it means. So this question telling you, if a portfolio has a positive investment, so what is a portfolio of stocks? So this is uh, considered as a portfolio, uh, a portfolio of stocks, holding of stocks that you have. So inside here, there's stock A, stock B, stock C, Hmm? Stock D, stock G, stock Z, uh, stock K, and so on and so on. All the stock inside one basket under your holdings. This is all belongs to you. So you hold all different all different kinds of stocks here. So that means you have a portfolio of stocks here. So the question asks, if a portfolio has a positive investment in every asset, so every one of these stocks are making money is positive. Okay, on the portfolio. Uh, can they expect, uh, no, is uh, every one of these assets is positive? Can the expected return on the portfolio be greater than that every asset? So expected return of the portfolio bigger than every expected return of the stock or not? Is it possible that the average return of this portfolio bigger than every single gain of these stocks or not? Cannot be what? Already say it's an average. An average means it's a, it's an average of all these things. You total up all together, divided to the number of stocks, and that is your average return. Okay, so that's your average return. So your average return could not be higher than every single one of these stocks. Okay, it could be equal or it could be higher than some of the stock only. So this question here, you must pay close attention. They say that uh, the expected return on the portfolio can be greater than every asset on the portfolio. Every means cannot wrong. Okay, if they say the expected return on the portfolio will be greater than some of the asset, then yes, that's correct. If every means no, the answer here is no. Then next, can it be less than every single asset in the portfolio? Also no. 
It cannot be the smallest, it cannot be the greatest to all assets also. Because it's an average. Okay, the most it could become is only equals to. All right, so this is very straightforward. Can you understand it? I think it's quite straightforward. Lah. Because let's say A is 10, all, all others 10, lah, but Z is 9, G is 18. So in the end, you average out your 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 portfolio is around eleven. So this eleven could be bigger than every single one, but cannot be bigger than G. So it's still not all. It's still some money. It's bigger than seven uh, six of the other assets, but not G. Ah, uh, okay. So that's that's the explanation. It cannot be bigger than every single one of it. It's impossible. Okay. So up until here, any questions regarding the theory section? <coughs> Come on, any questions so far? Come on. Are you guys okay? Can follow, cannot follow? Hello? All right. Thank you, Stephanie. First. At least responding to no me. Problem, sir. No problem, huh? Very good. Okay, then now you go to the calculations. <clears throat> this week calculation is actually fairly simple. There's only two formula. But the problem is the way to calculate it might be a little bit confusing to some students. Okay, and this question here, especially this question number seven here, it's a very favorable exam question. <clears throat> Usually, you will see it coming out in the exam. So, please pay close attention. And usually, when you come in an exam, students will lose half the marks at least. Or most of it. Okay, depending on how bad you don't understand. So, look at question 7 here. Based on the following information, calculate the expected return and standard deviation for two stocks. So, they give you the scenario of three different scenario here. Recessions, incident, normal, and also boom three different uh what do you call that uh environment okay are three different possibility of things happening and then probability pi here 20 percent chances of being recession 55 percent chances of being normal and 25 percent chance of it being a boom market <laughs> then the RI of stock A and stock B. Okay, the return on stock A and stock B in different situations. So if it's a recession, stock A will give you a 1% return. Normal situation, stock A gives you 9%. And uh, during the boom period, stock A can give you 14% return. <coughs> For stock B, <coughs> during recession, it will give you a negative 25%. Of return during a normal incident, they give you a 15% return, and during a boom period, they give you a 38% return. So, this is all given to you in the question. The question wanted you to find two things okay, number one, they want you to find the expected return of A and B, number two, they want you to find the standard deviation of A and B. So, let's do the expected return first. So, expected return. Is written as this. Expected return equals to the sum of probability multiplied by return. All right. So what does this mean? Let's do the expected return for A first. So the sum of probability multiplied by uh, return. So there is three different scenario here. 0 0.2. Multiply by the return of 0 0.01 plus 0 0.55 multiplied by 0 0.09 plus 0 0.25 multiplied by 0 0.14. This will give you 0 0.0865 or 8.65 percent. This is the standard. Uh, this is the expected return of A. Then. How do you do standard deviation? So the formula for standard deviation is written 
is sigma square root of the sum of probability multiplied by return minus expected return close bracket power of 2. This is the standard deviation calculation. Okay, so how do you calculate this? Now, let's start calculating standard deviation for A. So, square root of everything, uh, there's a square root, open bracket, probability 0 0.2, time switch, R1, okay, RI of uh, recession, 0 0.01, Minus expected return, which is this expected return, huh? okay? ERI is this expected return minus 0 0.0865 square plus the next one 0 0.55 times switch 0 0.09 minus 0 0.0865 square plus 0 0.25. <laughs> times with 0 0.14 minus 0 0.0865 square. Okay, so find out the standard deviation, square root of the figure here, 0 point, <coughs> 0 0.0, 0.0, 0, 0, 0, 0, so you will get the square root of this will be 0 0.0435 or 4.35%. This is standard deviation. So normally <coughs> what happens is students will not have any problem doing expected return. But when we come to standard deviation, they lost. So actually it's very simple. It's also probability times return but now instead of return only, the return minus of the expected return and square of it and power of two it, sorry. Power of two. <coughs> square it now, basically square it. <coughs> then when you add up all of this amount, you square root it to find out what is the standard deviation. So what is standard deviation? Standard deviation is also considered as the risk. Okay, the risk of the stock. All right, that's the other, the, the other meaning of standard deviation. So now, after you got the standard deviation for stock A and the expected return of stock A, do for stock B. Okay, do for stock B. So expected return of stock B, it's equals to probability is still the same, just that the return for stock B is different. The first one is negative, so put negative there, 0 0.25 plus 0 0.55 times with 0 0.15 plus 0 0.25 times with 0 0.38. This will give you the sum of 0 0.1275 or 12.75%. So set a division. For B, very easy. You see, uh, no rocket science one. Basically, this means probability 0 0.2 times with negative 0 0.25 minus 0 0.1275 square plus 0 0.55 times with 0 0.15 minus 0 0.1275 square. And last one, 0 0.25. Time switch 0 0.38 minus 0 0.1275 square. Close brackets. This will be square root of 0 0.04472. And the final answer is 0 0.2115 or 21.15%. So far, when calculating expected returns 
and also standard deviation any issue or not this is only for single stock huh? this is only for single stock any issue so far no huh? very good so if you look at your lecture slide i straight away do standard deviation because the question asks us for standard deviation if the question asks you variance, then you don't need to do the square root. If they ask you to do variance for A, means basically variance is this, sigma square. Means the answer here is 0 0.00189. No need to square root it. If they ask you the variance of B, so it's sigma square equals to 0 0.04472. The answer stops at here. No need to square root it. But this question, they ask you standard deviation. So let's say we do standard deviation. If let's say they ask you for variance, uh, this is to answer the variance question. All right. Okay. So please keep this in mind. So now we move on to the uh, portfolio. So let's look at C. Yeah? Uh, sorry, B. Yeah? What is the expected return on portfolio consisting of 80% A and the balance in B? So you're creating a portfolio now. Okay, your investment will be 80% holding of stock A and the balance will be on stock B. So there are two methods to count uh, portfolio expected return. Okay. Method number one. Method number one, expected, expected return of portfolio is equals to the sum of WIE RI. Ah, what is this? Okay, so basically, mm, wrong. Wrong color. The sum of weightage multiplied by expected return. Okay, this could also be derived as this uh, weightage of A for this question, uh, weightage of stock A times expected return of stock A plus weightage of stock B, expected return of stock B. So the first, the first method here to use this formula is very straightforward. You just fill in only. So there's 0 0.8 of stock A, 80% stock A, 0 0.8 of stock A. The expected return of stock A is 0 0.0865. Plus the balance 20% is 0 0.2 times with uh, expected return of stock B, 0 0.1275. This amount total up together will give you 0 0.0947. Or in percentage, it will be 9.47%. <clears throat> this is method one. Okay, this is method one. Method number two. Method number two. When will you use method one and method two? So method one, if you use method one, if the question did not ask you the standard deviation of the portfolio. If they never ask you standard deviation of portfolio, you can say we use method one. Very straightforward, very fast, very easy. If the question asks you to find the standard deviation of the portfolio, then you better use uh, no standard deviation of portfolio, you use one if there is. To use number two, you use the second method. So this second method is a bit more lengthy. Okay, so this second method basically you count the return of the portfolio in different scenario. So I told you there's three market market scenario here, which is recession, normal, and boom period. Three different kind of periods here. Okay. So there's return just now we already we, just now the previous table they give you the return for stock A and stock B. 
So now you want to count the return for this portfolio when there's a combination of 0 0.8 stock A, 0 0.2 stock B. Then there's probability. The probability is the same. It will not run. It's 0 0.2, 0 0.55, and 0 0.25. It's still the same. So the things that you count here is here to return. 0 0.8, 0 0.8 of stock A return, which is 0 0.1, plus with 0 0.2 times with negative 0 0.25. So this will give you a return during the recession for this portfolio, which is negative 0 0.042. <coughs> then during a normal period, 0 0.8 times with 0 0.09. Uh, this is 0 0.01, 1 percent only. Plus 0 0.2 of stock B, which has a return of 0 0.15. So this will give you 0. 1020, 10.2% return. Lastly, during the boom period, 80% stock A, which will give you 14% return, 20% chance of giving you 38% return. So this will give you a return of 0 0.1880. <coughs> okay, so you already got your return now of your portfolio for three different incidents. Then total up the PI, RI, probability, pro sorry, probability multiplied by returns. So this will give you negative 0 0.84. Okay, negative 0 0.84. This is in percentage form already. Yeah? If it's not in percentage form, this is 0, negative 0 0.0084. Okay, this is in percentage form. Huh? I already converted by multiply 100%. So this is in percentage form. This is 0 0.102 times 0 0.55. Okay, you get 5.61%. And the last one, you get 4.7%. So total all up together, you will get 9.47%. This is your expected return of your portfolio. Okay, 9.547, 9.47 equals to this. So this is in percentage form. If you put decimal, it's negative 0 0.0084, 0 0.0561, 0 0.0470. You get 0 0.0947. Okay, so this is a method number two. So method number two. So you use method number two if there's a question like this, when there's part C here, what is the standard deviation of the portfolio? So when they ask you to calculate the standard deviation of portfolio, all right, standard deviation of portfolio, it's equals to the same thing, the sum of probability, square root, uh, the sum of probability times with return minus expected return power of 2. Same thing. Again, <laughs> okay, standard deviation is the same for portfolio or even for singular stocks. So, let's calculate this. What is the standard deviation? Just take square root, okay, square root of the probability which is 0 0.2 uh, it's the same thing I told you, no changes. The portfolio return on recession is negative 0 0.042 minus the expected return of 0 0.0947 square plus 0 0.55 times with 0 0.102 minus 0 0.0947 square plus 0 0.25 times with 0 0.188 minus 0 0.0947 square, close bracket. Okay, you will get the square root of, <coughs> this square root number, uh, the more decimal point, the more accurate, put as many as you can. 
according to your calculator. 0059-5267. And this final answer that they give you is 0 0.0772 or 7.72%. 7 <laughs> All right, so now, because they call it cost standard deviation, you need this RI. And this RI, you need to calculate. Okay, if you use method number one, all right, you still need to repeat the method number two method to find the RI so you can calculate your standard deviation. If not, you cannot calculate standard deviation. Okay, so that's why I recommend you to always use method number two to be safe. Up until here, can cannot. Can follow, cannot follow. Any questions? Anyone lost so far? All okay, yeah? All right. I think all good. Thank you, Yong An, for responding, yeah? pretty much. Thank you very much. So let's move on. Okay, I see chat box, no, no issues, no one stopping me. I assume everyone is good. Then I'll move on then. <clears throat> Maybe you have questions after I completed. Then okay, you wait then. <coughs> so look at question 12 now. <coughs> question 12 here. They are calling you to calculate the portfolio betas. Okay, formula for portfolio beta or beta, portfolio, beta of portfolios. Okay, it's equals to the sum of weightage multiplied by beta. Uh, this is the simple formula here. So let's look through the question together. Please listen to this question carefully. Yeah? You own a portfolio equally invested in a risk-free assets and two stocks. So you own a portfolio where you equally invested in two stocks. and risk-free stocks. So in total, the portfolio have three stocks. So in your portfolio, you have three stocks. So you equally invested in all of them. <coughs> okay, equally invested. Huh? Equally invested means you invested one third, one third, one third. Okay, which means 33.3% 33.3%, 33.3% for each of these stocks. So one third lah, more accurate, easy to write. <coughs> okay, so the question tell you, if one of the stock has a beta of 1.45, okay, one of the stock is beta 1.45. And the total portfolio is equally as risky as the market. So this whole portfolio, the risk of this whole portfolio, okay, is risky as the market. It's the same as the market risk. So the problem here, you don't know what is market risk. What is the beta for market risk? Now, remember this. The beta for market risk is equals to one beta. When you say market risk, it's equals to one beta. <coughs> So this whole portfolio total up together will have one beta. Okay, the question tell you one of the stock is 1.45 beta. All right, and they want you to find the other stock's beta. So put this into an equation. So your portfolio are actually having this. One third stock A, one third stock B, one third risk-free stock and all these three total up together the risk is one beta <laughs> okay it's equals to one beta so stock a assume stock a is the one that having 1.45 beta so stock a is 1.45 beta stock b is unknown the one that you need to find the beta and risk-free risk-free means no risk one so beta is zero Mm. Remember this. Risk-free, 
theta is 0, then this equation equals to 1. Equals to 1 beta. Mm. So how to standardize this equation? Very simple. Shift the 3 over here. So it become 1.45 plus b plus 0 equals to 3. Okay? So b is equal to 3 minus 1.45. So the beta for stock B is 1.55 beta. Very easy. All right. Very simple, very easy. Okay. That is how you calculate the beta. So it's not hard. Just follow what the question tells you carefully. <coughs> okay. Just follow the question carefully. All right. So, the next thing that I'll introduce to you today is called, and the final thing today, uh, capital asset pricing model or the CAPM model. The formula for this CAPM model is this expected return is equal to risk free plus beta times expected return of the market minus risk free. This is the formula. Okay, this is the formula. So we will further talk about this next week also in the in our WACC. Okay, when in our weighted average cost of capital. So this formula is also used to calculate the return on equity. So return on equity is actually your expected return is the same thing. Okay, the expected return of the stock is actually your return of your equity. <coughs> All right, we'll talk about this next week. So today, they only want you to know what is capital asset pricing model. So look at question number 13. What are the information given to you? Using capital asset pricing model, a stock has a beta of 1.25. The expected return on the market, expected return EM of the market is 11.7%. And the risk-free rate is 3.5%. What is the expected return? Means find this. So filling into the formula, expected return it's equal to risk free 0 0.035 plus your beta 1.25 expected return of your market 0 0.117 minus your risk free and you can get your expected return straight away 0 0.1375 or 13.75 percent that means these stocks will potentially give you a return of 13.75 percent or the cost of this stock, you need to keep uh, uh, is 13.75%. Okay? Or the required rate of return of this stock is 13.75%. So it means the expected from this stock, the expectation for this stock is 13.75%. That's all. So many different ways to elaborate from what I mentioned just now. The expected return of this stock, okay, the expectation from you here is this stock will give you 13.75%. If you look in the perspective of WACC for next week one, this means the cost of the stock. So if you issue this stock, uh, this is the costing to you, to the company. But if you're an investor here, this is your expected return. All right. Two different angles here. Again, we'll explain that further next week. So look at question 16. Same formula, same methods, but different things they want you to find. Question 16 here, they tell you a stock has an expected return. Mm. They give you the ER instead, the expected return. Okay, the expected return here is 12.5%. And a beta 1.4. The expected return on the market, the EM. Expected return on the market. 
is 10.9%, they want you to find the RF. Just use the same formula just now, 0 0.125 equals to RF plus beta of 1.4 multiplied by expected return of markets minus RF. Okay, so expand this equation, 0 0.125 equals to RF plus 1.4 times 0 0.109 is 0 0.1526 minus 1.4 RF. Okay, so RF minus 1.4 is negative 0 0.4, shift it over, is 0 0.4 RF, then 0 0.1526 minus 0 0.125. So your RF here is 0 0.0276. Divided by 0 0.4. The final answer is 0 0.0690 or 6.90 percent. This is all risk free rate. All right. And that's it. Okay. And that's the final question for this tutorial. Any uh, Question so far? Anyone lost up until here? No, sir. All good. Very well. Okay. So I'll give you the extra tutorial questions. You need to attempt it. Okay. You need to attempt it and see whether can you get the uh, answers. So A is 16% and 17%. B is 7%. And 14.18%. C, try both methods uh, to see whether can you get or not 16.6. And lastly, your standard deviation will be 11.17%. Okay, these are the answer for the extra tutorial question. All right, explore and try this. Okay, explore and try this. All right.